Chapter Twenty Two of Elusive Isabel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Elusive Isabel by Jacques Futrelle. Chapter Twenty Two, The Compact. A room, low-ceilinged, dim, gloomy, sinister as an inquisition chamber, a single large table in the center, holding a kerosene lamp, writing materials, and a metal spheroid a shade larger than a one-pound shell, and around it a semicircle of silent, masked, and cowled figures. There were twelve of them, eleven men and a woman. In the shadows which grew denser at the far end of the room, was a squat, globular object, a massive, smooth-sided, black, threatening thing of iron. One of the men glanced at his watch. It was just two o'clock, then rose and took a position beside the table, facing the semicircle. He placed the timepiece on the table in front of him. Gentlemen, he said, and there was the faintest trace of a foreign accent. I shall speak English, because I know that whatever your nationality, all of you are familiar with that tongue. And now an apology for the theatric aspect of all this, the masks, the time and place of meeting, and the rest of it. He paused a moment. There is only one person living who knows the name and position of all of you. And by a sweep of his hand he indicated the motionless figure of the woman. It was by her decision that masks are worn, for while we all know the details of the Latin compact, there is a bare chance that someone will not sign, and it is not desirable that the identity of that person be known to all of us. The reason for the selection of this time and place is obvious, for an inkling of the proposed signing has reached the Secret Service. I will add the United States was chosen as the birthplace of this new epoch in history for several reasons, one being the proximity to Central and South America, and another the inadequate police system which enables greater freedom of action. He stopped and drew from his pocket a folded parchment. He tapped the tips of his fingers with it from time to time as he talked. The Latin compact, gentlemen, is not the dream of a night nor of a decade. As long as fifty years ago it was suggested, and whatever differences the Latin countries of the world have among themselves, they have always realized that ultimately they must stand together against, against the other nations of the world. This idea germinated into action three years ago, and since that time agents have covered the world in its interest. This meeting is the fruition of all that work, and this, he held the parchment aloft, is the instrument that will unite us. Never has a diplomatic secret been kept as this has been kept. Never has a greater reprisal been planned. It means, gentlemen, the domination of the world, socially, spiritually, commercially, and artistically. It means that England and the United States, whose sphere of influence has extended around the globe, will be beaten back, that the flag of the Latin countries will wave again over lost possessions. It means all of that, and more. His voice had risen as he talked until it had grown vibrant with enthusiasm, and his hands pointed his remarks with quick, sharp gestures. All this, he went on, was never possible until three years ago, when the navies of the world were given over to the hands of one nation, my country. Five years ago, a fellow countryman of mine happened to be present at an electrical exhibition in New York City, and there he witnessed an interesting experiment, practical demonstration of the fact that a submarine mine may be exploded by the use of the Marconi wireless system. He was a practical electrician himself, and the idea lingered in his mind. For two years he experimented, and finally this resulted. He picked up the metal spheroid and held it out for their inspection. 
As it stands, it is absolutely perfect and gives a world supremacy to the Latin countries because it places all the navies of the world at our mercy. It is a variation of the well-known percussion cap, or fuse, by which mines and torpedoes are exploded. The theory of it is simple, as are the theories of all great inventions. The secret of its construction is known only to its inventor, a man of whom you never heard. It is merely that the mechanism of the cap is so delicate that the Marconi wireless waves, and only those, will fire the cap. In other words, this cap is tuned, if I may use the word, to a certain number of vibrations and half-vibrations. A wireless instrument of high power, with a modifying addition which the inventor has added, has only to be set in motion to discharge it at any distance up to 25 miles. High-power wireless waves recognize no obstacle, so the explosion of a submarine mine is as easily brought about as would be the explosion of a mine on dry land. You will readily see its value as a protective agency for our seaports. He replaced the spheroid on the table. But its chief value is not in that, he resumed. Its chief value to the Latin compact gentlemen, is that the United States and England are now concluding negotiations, unknown to each other, by which they will protect their seaports by means of mines primed with this cap. The tuning of the caps which we will use is known only to us. The tuning of the caps which they will use is also known to us. The addition to the wireless apparatus which they will use is such that they cannot, even by accident, explode a mine guarding our seaports. But, on the other hand, the addition to the wireless apparatus which we will use permits of the extreme high charge which will explode their mines. To make it clear, we could send the Navy against such a city as New York or Liverpool and explode every mine in front of us as we want, and meanwhile our mines are impervious. Another word, and I have finished. Five gentlemen, whom I imagine are present now, have witnessed the test of this cap, by direct command of their home governments. For the benefit of the others of you, a simple test has been arranged for tonight. This cap on the table is charged. Its inventor is at his wireless instrument, fifteen miles away. At three o'clock he will turn on the current that will explode it. Four of the eleven men looked at their watches. It is now seventeen minutes past two. I am instructed for the purposes of the test to place this cap anywhere you may select, in this house or outside of it, in a box, sealed or under water, the purpose is merely to demonstrate its efficacy, to prove to your complete satisfaction that it can be exploded under practically any conditions. His entire manner underwent a change. He drew a chair up to the table and stood for an instant with his hand resting on the back. The compact is written in three languages, English, French, and Italian. I shall ask you to sign, after reading either or all, precisely as the directions you have received from your home government instruct. On behalf of the three greatest Latin countries, as special envoy of each, I will sign first. He dropped into the chair, signed each of the three parchment pages three times, then rose and offered the pen to the cowled figure at one end of the semicircle. The man came forward, read the English transcript, studied the three signatures already there with a certain air of surprise, then signed. The second man signed, the third man, and the fourth. The fifth had just risen to go forward when the door opened silently, and Mr. Grimm entered. Without a glance either to right or left, he went straight toward the table and extended a hand to take the compact. For an instant there had come amazement, 
a dumb astonishment at the intrusion. It passed, and the hand of the man who had done the talking darted out, seized the compact, and held it behind him. "'If you will be good enough to give that to me, your highness,' suggested Mr. Grimm quietly. For half a minute the masked man stared straight into the listless eyes of the intruder, and then, "'Mr. Grimm, you are in very grave danger.' "'That is beside the question,' was the reply. "'Be good enough to give me that document.' He backed away as he spoke, kicked the door closed with one heel, then leaned against it, facing them. "'Or better yet,' he went on after a moment, "'burn it. There is a lamp in front of you.' He paused for an answer. "'It would be absurd of me to attempt to take it by force,' he added. End of chapter 22 Recording by Roger Moline